Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York and today I wanted to do a video on the subject of atrial fibrillation and in particular this video is entitled type 1 and type 2 atrial fibrillation. Now that's a complete unique idea but I truly truly believe that there are two different types of atrial fibrillation. Um, and I hope uh, that in this video I'll talk to you about those and you will start understanding what I mean. So, the first thing to say is that most medical conditions in the Western world are caused by one or more of the following conditions. Age, genetics, luck and lifestyle. Let's look at diabetes for example. There is type 1 diabetes which is usually something that affects younger patients and that is usually attributed to bad genetics or bad luck. All right. And then there is type 2 diabetes, which tends to affect older patients, and this is usually attributed to age or lifestyle. They're managed differently. Type 1 diabetes is treated with insulin. Type 2 diabetes is treated with uh, lifestyle management, weight loss, diet, uh, tablets sometimes, and sometimes insulin, but largely it is believed that um, type 2 diabetes is lifestyle related and therefore modification of lifestyle forms a big part of the treatment of type 2 diabetes. In the same way, I believe that there are two types of atrial fibrillation uh, and they're caused by different things, but unfortunately their atrial fibrillation is thought of as just one condition uh, and therefore all atrial fibrillation tends to be managed in the same way. But ideally, I think there are subtle differences and they should be managed differently. And if you can understand the differences, then it may allow us to target those treatments uh, which will give uh, target specific patient groups with specific treatments which will give them the most benefit. Okay, so type 1 atrial fibrillation. All right, this is not a term that has been used before, but I hope that... Um, <laughs> Uh, that at some point people will start recognizing that there are two separate types of atrial fibrillation. Type 1 atrial fibrillation, now we know that most patients with atrial fibrillation, we know that most atrial fibrillation is seen in older patients with comorbidities. However, we do see it in younger patients and in patients who have no comorbidities. This has historically been termed low natural fibrillation, particularly if you're under the age of 60, you don't have diabetes or high blood pressure or vascular disease, but you develop atrial fibrillation. Uh, this used to be termed low AFib. Um, the prevalence of low AFib is between 2% and 30%, and we're not really sure. Different studies uh, have used different criteria to um, define low AFib, but there is a, uh, I would say, around 10 to 20% of patients with AFib have lone AFib, i.e. they're young uh, and they don't have any other comorbidities, but they have AFib. And when you look at these patients, in these patients, because they are young and they have no comorbidities, you will find that their AFib is usually caused either because of genetics or bad luck. In fact, a significant proportion of such patients will turn around and say there's a family history of atrial fibrillation and we know that atrial fibrillation can be inherited. So in this group of patients, the causes for the atrial fibrillation are just are usually genetic or just plain bad, bad luck. It's very interesting because when you scan these patients with an echocardiogram, you find that their left atrium is of normal size. Okay. And often their atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal, it comes and goes. And interestingly, these patients seem to tolerate their atrial fibrillation extremely poorly. They hate being in atrial fibrillation. When the atrial fibrillation comes, they feel really yuck, they feel breathless, they feel dizzy, they feel extremely unwell with it. Okay, now, but the interesting thing is when you follow these patients up, their prognosis is extremely good. In fact, there was a study several years ago by Professor Bernard Gersh where he took 97 such patients with low atrial fibrillation, followed them up for 15 years without any anticoagulants or anything like that, and found that a very, very, very small percentage, or a cumulative risk of 1.3% or something like that. Um, so these patients do not seem to get strokes. They have a very low risk of strokes 
uh, uh, which is actually comparable to the normal population. So I think this is type 1 atrial fibrillation. Um, so they have an exceptionally good prognosis, but they seem to tolerate their atrial fibrillation extremely poorly when they get it. Um, so their quality of life is not so good because of the atrial fibrillation, but their quantity of life is much the same as the normal population. And interestingly, these patients seem to uh, respond very well to ablation for AFib. So in these patients, they seem to respond extremely well and um, in all likelihood, the atrial fibrillation, uh, sorry, a AF ablation seems to sort their problems out, all right? Then there is type 2 atrial fibrillation. These are older patients with atrial fibrillation, usually above the age of 60. They, um, they usually have diabetes or high blood pressure or sleep apnea and, or in vascular disease. Um, and in these people, the AFib develops because of increased age and bad lifestyle. Remember, type 1 AFib, I think, is caused by uh, luck or bad genetics. And type 2 AFib tends to be more associated with increased age and more comorbidities. Interestingly, when you scan these patients' hearts, they have big sized left atria and they seem to tolerate their AFib much better than patients who have type 1 AFib. So, um, <clears throat> In these patients, often you will find that they may be in persistent atrial fibrillation, and the first time the AFib is picked up is when they have an incidental flu jab and someone just feels their pulse and says, oh, did you know you're an AFib? And the patient says, no, I don't know anything. Um, however, even though they tolerate their atrial fibrillation much better and their atrial fibrillation is often persistent, when you follow them up, they do very badly in the long term. In the, in, in, in the long term. They have a much higher incidence of strokes. They have a much higher incidence of heart failure. They even have a higher incidence of sudden death. And these patients are the patients who require anticoagulation to reduce the risk of strokes. Um, often these patients don't seem to respond as well to ablation as those patients who have type 1 AFib. And even when they do, they often have to have repeated procedures, so more than one procedure. It's also interesting uh, to say that in these patients, taking away the atrial fibrillation doesn't seem to alter their risk of strokes or overall prognosis because the overall prognosis and the risk of strokes in some way is conferred upon them by their age and their comorbidities. And therefore, I think what we need to do is we need to start thinking of these as two separate diseases. And in patients who have type 1 atrial fibrillation, I think they should be treated with reassurance and be told that actually your risks from this condition are extremely low. However, if they have, uh, if the atrial fibrillation is significantly affecting their quality of life, then these are the patients who would benefit from ablation and benefit in a big way. So in my own mind, if I see a young person who I think has low atrial fibrillation, I have no hesitation in considering referring them for uh, ablation. Uh, however, patients with type 2 atrial fibrillation, I think they should be treated with anticoagulation because that affects their prognosis and certainly reduces the risk of strokes. I think they certainly should be treated with lifestyle modification, much as type 2 diabetics are. Uh, and often it is unfortunate that we don't uh, emphasize lifestyle modification as much as we should in these patients. And, um, and these are the patients who benefit from things like rate control. Um, now, you can still consider ablation in these patients, but it is less likely to be uh, as successful as in patients with type 1 AFib. Uh, and I would generally uh, refer patients with type 2 AFib um, uh, if they had refractory symptoms, or if I tried everything else and despite that they were still suffering symptoms uh, and the symptoms were significantly affecting their quality of life, then uh, I wouldn't hesitate in referring them on. Uh, but in general, I would want to treat them firstly uh, with anticoagulation, obviously, and lifestyle modification. Um, so I think hopefully as time progresses, our um, thinking and our um, and the messages we give about AFib will change and we'll try and start separating uh, 
type 1 atrial fibrillation with type 2 atrial fibrillation. As I say, no one has actually really used these terms before, and I'm probably the first person who's saying who's defining these like this. But I really truly believe that there are two separate types of atrial fibrillation and they should be treated in different ways. So um, I hope this was useful. Uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. Um, uh, so please um, don't hesitate and please do drop me some comments or a message. Um, uh, my um, email address is yourcardiology at gmail.com. My website is www.yourcardiology.co.uk. Uh, and you can also access my Facebook page uh, via um, uh, www, sorry, it's Facebook, yeah, it's yourcardiology at gmail.com. If you type that, you'll find me. All right. Thank you so much. I really enjoy talking to you. I really enjoy your messages. Um, and for those of you who are not really, who get bored by listening to me, I really enjoy putting you to sleep. <laughs> and I think sleep is great for AFib. So thank you so much. Um, and all the best. Take care.